And now I am pleased to introduce this afternoon's speaker, Dr. Nick Sider. <clears throat> Nick is a field crop entomologist with the University of Illinois. He develops insect management recommendations for soybean and corn production in Illinois, and he has a doctoral degree in entomology from Clemson U University and both bachelor's and master's degrees in entomology from Purdue University. Nick's talk this afternoon will present current recommendations for soybean pest management in Illinois, including updated economic thresholds for defoliating insects, management guidelines for pop feeders like stink bugs and leaf bean beetles, uh, bean leaf beetles, excuse me, and pest risk following a rye cover crop. So please welcome, please join me in welcoming Dr. Nick Sider. Hey, everybody hear me? Well, thank you. Um, thank you for having me. I uh, really appreciate the opportunity to visit with you here today. Um, like you said, we'll, we'll focus on hot feeding insects probably a lot today. How much I focus on hot feeding insects is probably going to depend on how much I ramble talking about hot feeding insects. I always put the thing I want to talk about the most first in case I go too long. Which I often do. Um, we can talk about whatever y'all want to talk about them. So if you have other issues you're concerned with, other insect management issues, uh, be happy to switch gears and talk about that. But in general, um, what conversation we've had about insects today, throughout the day, has been about those pod feeders. Um, so selfishly, I was a little pleased to hear that. So, oh, I won't be talking about something that's completely meaningless. But that's good. And for us in Illinois, this is kind of the one area where, you know, I feel like in general, with a lot of our insect pests, we maybe pay a little too much attention to some of them. We, we probably pay a little too much attention to Japanese beetles. We, we definitely pay a little too much attention to Japanese beetles, unless you grow roses or something like that. Um, you know, in soybean, yeah, we, we think about Japanese beetles a little more than we probably need to. We might not think enough about stink bugs. We might not think enough about beetles <laughs> feeding on pods. And so that's what I wanted to focus on today. Of course, it's hard to think about it. Uh, it's a time that no one wants to be walking in soybeans, at least of all me. Uh, every time I tell my technician we've got another stink bug project, she gives me that look of like, we're going to have to sweep those damn beans, aren't we? <laughs> yeah. It's going to suck, isn't it? It's going to be unpleasant. Very difficult insects to scout for, uh, time of year where insects are usually the last thing on our mind. When we look at insects that affect yield in Illinois, they're probably the most important right now. Um, unless you're unlucky enough to have like the last field of soybean aphids um, in the state. Yeah, it, it's probably hot feeding insects with us in terms of what's moving the beetle that way. Um, first, we're going to talk about here is, is stink bugs, and these are going to be in general, especially the further south you go, um, the more damage of these. Now, if you get up into northern Illinois, and you might have a hard time finding an economic population of stink bugs. Um, the further south you go, and that carries over to the rest of the U.S., right, um, the more damage you're going to see in general from stink bugs. These are an insect, they have what we call a piercing sucking mouth part. It's a little needle, that's all it is. I don't know how many of you have picked one up and looked at the mouth parts like I have. They're really kind of fascinating looking. They're going to jab that soybean seed, and, and that's really what they want to feed on is the seeds. Um, and they'll feed on seeds from a variety of other plants too. They'll inject the saliva into that seed, with that mouth part, they can't ingest anything that isn't liquid. Like they can't, it's kind of like a kidney stone, you know, if they've got a solid, they can't get it through that little needle. So they liquefy, they inject a digestive enzyme into whatever they're feeding on, they liquefy it, and that's what they slurp up. They actually do a cross section of that, that mouth part, it's kind of cool, there's two channels there. There's the, the salivary channel and the feeding channel. And so they're constantly spitting out saliva and ingesting this fluid that results from that. What that's going to do to the soybean seed, um, if it feeds early enough, it'll kill it. Um, so if it feeds on like an R5 pot, that very first developing seed is going to kill that seed. If you get enough of that, you'll get flat pot. Um, 
we don't see a lot of that usually in Illinois. And, and usually when we see our stink bug populations start to build up, it's a little later than that. We're talking about more like mid to late R5 on into R6. And, and those populations tend to kind of build up throughout pod fill um, until the pods start to dry down and then they fly off and go after whatever seeds they can find. Again, most of these are not like that particular. Um, the later it is when they start that feeding, the less impact you have on yield, and the more that impact is on quality instead. Um, so in addition to removing tissue, they're killing a part of that seed when they feed on it. And, and what you'll see actually is a lot of wrinkling of those seeds and distortion. If you ever look at a fruit that's been fed on by stink bugs, you'll see this a lot more clearly. Basically, that spot they fed on dies and everything continues to grow around it. It sort of wraps around it. They call it cat facing. I don't, I don't know why. I don't know why they call it that. It's like peaches. But it's doing kind of the same thing in, in soybean. It can also be an entry site for pathogens. So you get that discoloration, you get that wrinkling. And you can get docked for that at the elevator if you have enough of that kind of damage. Um, and, and we have three species. We've got real creative names for them. You know, we just name them after their color. Um, so we've got the, the brown stink bug. Um, this is one that we've had. It, it's a native species, uh, years and years and years. What's interesting about this when we see it in both soybean and corn. Uh, we don't see the greens in, in corn as frequently. Um, one thing to note about brown stink bugs, and this will carry over to brown marmorated stink bugs as well, they do tend to be a little more difficult to kill than the green species. So if you do have to put an insecticide application out, if you have high populations of these, they can be a little bit more difficult to get rid of. Um, you might have to think about a, a bifenthrin here, maybe to think about having an organophosphate in there with it for a premixed product. Depends how many of them you have, but they are a little bit more difficult to control than the green species. And I like to have the, the image of the nymph up there as well. Um, you really want to be considering these nymphs when you go out there. When you start to see a lot of nymphs, you know, that's an indication that that population that is sort of set it in there, right? And, and one thing you'll, you'll notice, the net doesn't have wings. Immature insects never have wings. They're stuck there. Um, so they're going to be feeding on that soybean plant. With the adults, uh, you know, there's a chance they'll come in there and they'll go off with something better. Uh, the marmorates in particular uh, really like to get around. In specialty crops, that's a bad thing because they jump from fruit to fruit and like feed on this one and ruin it, feed on this one and ruin it, like hop from one to the other, uh, like a little kid, you know, sticking his finger in the buffet or something like that, uh, just ruining everything. For soybeans, that doesn't matter so much, but they have that, that behavior and that can impact their damage, especially crops a little bit. Brown marmorated stink bug, as an adult, and one thing I'll tell you when we when we talk about identification, distinguishing these from the brown stink bug in a picture becomes fairly difficult. The reason for that, that, that marmoration, that variability on the back of the insect in particular, when you shine a light on brown stink bug, like a photographic flash, or when you take a direct picture of it in sunlight, it looks a lot more speckled that it's actually going to look when you see this thing in the field. Whereas with the brown marmorated stink bug, once you get used to, to seeing that thing, you're not going to mistake it once you know what that looks like. But when you're first starting to learn this, which one to look for here in the marmorated, you see these stripes up on the antennae, the, the black and white alternating stripes there. They've got the same thing going on. You can't see it very well on the legs. Um, the other thing they've got that's a little bit unique, and you'll, you'll start to see this as you look at more of them, they've got a little different posture than, than the brown stink bug does. The way they run around is a little bit different. It's hard to describe. They almost look like they're running around on stilts, it is the way I think about it. Um, 
some of the key in on the field and use those in handy to, to learn the difference and then you'll you'll start to pick up on it. The immatures obviously are very distinctive. Um, very distinctive compared with the, the brown stink bugs, which unfortunately are kind of green as a new, uh, which confuses a lot of people. There's a third species here, and this is really the one this past year that we probably saw the highest numbers of in soybean, and that was the green stink bug. We do tend to see more of these further south, uh, especially. Uh, the marmorated and the browns tend to do a little better, it seems, uh, in older climates than green stink bugs do. So the further south you go, the greater proportion of these green stink bugs you're likely to see. Uh, the nymphs are really crazy looking when they first hatch. They're they're black with these orange stripes. Um, I don't know if anybody's ever seen that out in the field. And as they get older, uh, they become more green and they take on this orange appearance um, around the border of that insect. Now, in terms of the damage that these three species do, it's basically identical. Um, there's no real difference here. They feed at a similar enough rate. Um, that we don't really, like we don't take greens more serious than browns, for instance. We, we treat them all about the same in terms of our scouting. A couple of subtle differences here. One, as I mentioned earlier, the brown species tend to be more difficult to control. Two, when we look at brown marmorated stink bug in particular, they have a habit of getting spooked. And when they get spooked, they'll drop. Um, you'll see this sometimes if you go out in the field and, and poke around at stink bugs, which is something I do, probably not something, you know, just people do, but I tend to go out and do this kind of thing. And, and as you walk up on these, they'll actually spook, they'll, they'll drop to the ground. As a consequence of that, they're a little more difficult to sample, and, and we tend to underestimate their numbers a little bit. Um, as opposed to the other species. Now, what the other species will do, um, and, and you've probably seen this before, especially in corn, uh, they'll sort of sidestep around the stem and jump to the back. And, and you can watch them doing this. It, well, it reminds me of a cartoon, like maybe a bigger fella trying to hide behind a telephone pole, you know. I still see them. Um, it, it, it's the same kind of a thing. But they're pretty sneaky on corn in particular. They become fairly difficult to scout for that reason. And, and that's one of the really important things to think about when it comes to scouting. Um, and, and there's a picture of the eggs that the egg masses all tend to look like um, with those plant feeding species. Uh, you've all seen this, I'm sure. Um, the damage, uh, one thing to note here. Of course, you've got clean seeds over here and increasing levels of damage as you go through. Again, yield and quality concern here. One thing to note with that is coloration. Because there are some pathogen relationships involved, moisture both makes this damage worse, but it can also lead to some very similar damage in and of itself when you have a lot of moisture that harvest as those seeds are maturing. You can confuse moisture damage for stink bug damage. Um, many people do all the time. And at the elevator, I just realized that thing was shining the laser the entire time. I hope I didn't unintentionally <laughs> blind anybody throughout this. Um, hopefully it didn't shine out into any airplanes that were flying by or anything like that. Um, but when we look at that moisture damage, okay, so when they, when they find that at the elevator, they're probably going to say stink bug um, is what they're going to say. Usually it was, but, but occasionally you'll get docked for what they call stink bug damage, but is actually moisture damage. Now, in terms of the price you get, that's academic, it's damaged, it's lower quality, whatever, you, you know, you're still going to get docked for. Uh, of course, when we talk about management, there's a pretty critical difference there, right? There's nothing we can spray to prevent it from raining five inches on that mature pod. So the reason I point that out to you is that if you had a year where you went out and looked, you were scouting for stink bugs, you couldn't find stink bugs, and then you got docked for stink bug damage at the elevator, 
you might not have made a mistake. Um, there are other reasons you can get that quality dockage. Um, if you examine it closely enough, you'll find the feeding sites. You'll actually go in there and find the feeding sites for this kind of thing. Um, you also have some predatory stink bugs. And in terms of scouting, we don't have enough of these in Illinois really to, to make a huge difference, but I did want to point that out to you. If you can't see that very clearly, that is a lightning bug being fed on by a spine soldier bug. Um, it's actually injected some out part into the back. Um, pretty cool to watch that. The lightning bug was actually kind of dragging it around. It was next maybe, you know, someone with a lasso around the cow um, getting pulled around by it a little bit. You do see this happen from time to time. These species are either a plant feeding stink bug or a predatory stink bug. So you don't have, for instance, plant feeders feeding on other insects. Um, but that's just something to note there. Superficially, it looks quite a bit like a brown stink bug. If you flip that over and look at the mouth parts, you'll actually see mouth parts in that spine soldier bug are kind of like a sword. Uh, they're fairly thick and robust. Mouth parts on a brown stink bug are more like a straw um, because, you know, the soybean seed doesn't bite back when you inject it. Um, in terms of our threshold, what I mentioned about brown marmorated stink bugs being able to sneak away, that, that becomes especially critical if you're sampling for these through visual scanning. So we've got that threshold of one per row foot. Of course, this is going to vary a little bit based on how good you are at finding these things, right? Um, that's if you're finding all of them. Typically, it's if you're using a shake sheet. I don't know how many of you are using a shake sheet or even know what a shake sheet is. Um, I used to work in cotton in Arkansas, so I know what a shake sheet is. You lay a sheet on the ground and you bend those plants over top of it and shake the crap out of it, is essentially how that works. If you're going out and looking visually, you're not going to look down in the canopy and find one every row of feet, right? You're just not. What you are going to find if you're at an economic threshold for stink bugs, you're going to see. Um, you're not going to be walking a field and not seeing stink bugs if you're at that level. Now, I'd love for you to use a net to scout these. That's going to be the most effective way that we have. I know full well that probably zero of you have a sweet net in your truck. Less it's you, Doug, you want to have one. I've got one in the back of my truck. I, I know what sweet bean soybeans is like. I know most people aren't going to do that. Just be aware that the less effective, the less efficient your sampling is. You know, just keep that in mind as you're thinking about these trees. The other thing to note about this threshold, and we'll we'll talk about the foliation thresholds a little bit. That's what I talked about at this meeting last year, so I'm not going to really belabor that. Not all of these economic thresholds are created equal. Some of these, we have a very robust relationship between insect presence, insect feeding, and yield reduction. That relationship in the case of stink bugs is not nearly as well defined. Why? The stink bugs are hard to um, They like to die when you put them in a cage. Like they want to die, you throw them in a cage, and they're just, they grow. Um, and, and that's what you have to do to develop these economic thresholds. So keep that in mind. I, I, I don't want to get calls from you that are like, well, I'm at seven and a half in this class. You need to know, should I make the application? Or, yeah, you should probably make the application. Um, you're finding stink bugs regularly. You should probably make that application. One thing I do want to stress to you here. I wanted to stress something to you. That application that you put out at R3 um, at Bloom because you were driving across the field with the side isn't going to touch things. It, it's not going to be there at R5 when these start to build up in the field. Whether you want to use that application or not, you know, I, I'm not going to fight that battle here today. But what I want to point out to you here, and, and this is the case with both of these pot feeding species. If you're putting that application out there prophylactically and hoping that you're going to get prevention, you're probably 
um, you're, you're probably going to find. If you're not spraying insects that are out there actually in the field, you're not going to kill them. You're going to kill some of them. Um, you'll, you'll kill some insects. It just won't be the ones that are actually evil in terms of guilt laws. Any questions about stink bugs? Yeah. That is referred to iron or R5. That's when, so even, I'll tell you what, even an R5 that's preventative where you don't have stink bugs, but you think they might come in, that stuff's going to last maybe five to 10 days for stink bug control. It's not going to last too much longer than that. You get a little bit of variability if you're using something systemic, using an EOMT noise, but you're not going to get a lot. When these tend to start building up for us in Illinois um, is late R5 on into R6. That's when we tend to see higher populations uh, for the most part. And there's a good reason for that. They're feeding on seeds. They're not, they're, they'll feed on the pod because there's a seed in there, but they're not necessarily interested in the pods themselves. They don't care about the foliage. Like they do not care about the foliage. If you find them in there R3 and earlier, they're just passing through. Um, they're not in there feeding on that plant. Um, they just don't have some of the better be on, I guess. Uh, but that's when we tend to see those populations building up this way. Yes, sir. The brown marmot is it over the years, right? It does. It yeah. is. They all invade, they all they, they all winter here um, to varying degrees and varying success. I would say the green is going to be the most winter sensitive of the group, and that's why we tend to see higher numbers of them to the south. One thing that's kind of interesting when we talk around the north central states, you know, in Illinois, um, it's down a little bit further south than a lot of the other states do. We tend to see a lot more green stick bugs than, for instance, Ohio. Indiana, certainly Iowa, um, because of that geography. If you go too far south, so if you get down into Arkansas, where I used to work, Mississippi, Louisiana, they've got an insect called the red banded stink bug. And that's a completely different ballgame. And so if you ever get into the southern US and you're working with that particular insect, uh, that's a whole nother thing. But it does not like that. At all. Um, we haven't been able to find that one here. There's one kind of red called the red shoulder stink bug that looks fairly similar, but is a wimp compared to the red banded. Um, so we fortunately don't have to worry about that. Any other? Yeah. So there are certain gamma agents due to spray, or does it get down in the canopy, or do they move around them to take advantage of a, of a application and then get still yeah they do move around a lot and, and so we don't in general see those coverage impacts with that the way we do maybe with other species i mean good coverage is always better you know we think about it five gallons usually better than three and that gallon is going to be better than five fifty you, you know but it's not going to be as sensitive to that water volume as maybe some other species are and, and it may be when we think about it, like like corn, if you're trying to penetrate corn. But yeah, good question. Anything else on stink bugs? Talk about mainly leaf beetles a little bit. Um, this is a really interesting one to me. This is one that for many years we didn't really think about a lot um, in, in entomology for a, a variety of reasons. We've seen some fairly high populations in this geography um, over the last few years. Not so much this last fall. Um, we had some isolated spots, but two years ago, three years ago, we had some pretty high numbers of being in the field and had some pretty high numbers late in the field and had in some cases some fairly high levels of this pod star. Now, as far as damage to the plant goes, this is very different from what stink bugs are doing. So where stink bugs are targeting that seed, bean leaf beetles are feeding on that green piece of the pot um, because they want that green tissue. They're not interested in the seed. If you were to pop that pot open right then, seed would be fine. There wouldn't be any damage to the seed at all. There's no direct damage from the bean beetle. What happens when we have this sort of damage 
is that as that pod dries down, gaps open um, where you have those feeding scars. That's going to allow water. It's going to allow pathogens in. And that leads to some yield impacts and especially some quality impacts from this. Now, one reason it's important to distinguish that kind of damage from state bug feeding. Okay, if that state bug fed on that soybean seed, that seed has some damage. Uh, may or may not be enough, depending on when it happens, to matter the elevator, but it's going to have some damage. Not every pod that gets fed on like that is going to lead to a damaged seed. Um, in fact, the vast majority of them are. But if you have enough of this kind of feeding, that is going to add up. Um, that is going to add up to some damage to those seeds in there. Now, this is bean leaf beetle, very familiar insect, I think, certainly to anybody who's ever known green bean. Um, probably the most common insect, certainly the most common insect pest that we find in the soybeans throughout the eastern U.S. Every place that I've ever worked in soybeans, and that's Indiana, South Carolina, Arkansas, here, every single field I go to, you can always find a few of these guys, always. Uh, they're going through two generations per year. Um, we have a middle generation in the summer that tends not to really amount to much. Uh, we see relatively low numbers of adults um, kind of in July. Uh, and then towards the end of August, you get a second generation that causes this seed feeding. Incidentally, that's the same generation that overwinters, and then if you have early soybeans that get infested by these, those are the same beetles that you're seeing uh, early in the season following year. They defoliate, they feed on soybean foliage. They tend to be somewhat of a wimpy defoliator, the defoliation in and of itself. Yeah, it's there. Um, not something that we worry about a ton. It, it's that pot scarring, uh, certainly that concerns me. And I think that ultimately in Illinois, uh, it's going to have a bigger impact on yield. Um, one thing to note here, we see a lot of eels in, in soybean, and occasionally I do get some confusion on that. So just to be clear, like Japanese beetles don't do this, corn worm beetles don't do this, uh, clover worm and caterpillars don't really do this. Corn earworm can, but we don't see those kind of populations of corn earworm in Illinois in general. It, it's bean leaf beetles that are causing this hot summer. Um, the one thing we've had, yeah, back to the Two slides ago. Just curious about um, BPMB. Any problem with the virus? Yeah, good point. Yeah, there's problems with it. Um, it's a little bit variable. Um, and, and one of the things that makes a uh, bean pod model virus difficult to, to deal with, if it's present, that feeding early in the season can be very impactful. Um, if it's not present, that feeding early in the season doesn't amount to anything. Um, so a very big difference in terms of the, the seriousness of that generation, depending on whether you're in an area where you've dealt with bean pod model virus um, as, a, as a problem. Um, and when we look at the symptoms of that, especially there's distortion of the leaves that you'll see uh, throughout the season. Um, and that, yeah, that can have an impact on yield that goes well beyond what the foliation itself is. So yeah, that, that's a good point. If that's something you've dealt with historically, you want to approach the endocrine of this insect a little bit different, particularly early in the season. Um, but if we don't have bean pod modifiers in the system, then that early season foliation is sort of cosmetic. Um, yeah, good point. Okay, so we've had relatively high populations of bean beetles last year. So we've been able to get um, some pretty decent efficacy data on this insect. One thing to point out with our insecticide efficacy data, the quality of it is related not so much to how damaging the pest is, but how many of them there are, right? That's the reason we're able to gather this information for bean leaf beetle pretty effectively and not so much for stink bugs. Um, so we've got a lot more insecticide data on bean leaf beetles from Illinois um, than we do stink bugs, even though stink bugs 
by and large, are the bigger problems. And the good news about it, like when we look at control of mean leaf beetle late in the season, we do a pretty good job here uh, with just about everything that we throw at it. Uh, again, in the mid south, there's some issues that pop up with insecticide resistance. They tend to be year to year issues. So you've got some fitness costs there where that resistance doesn't persist over multiple generations so much. Here, cheap pyrethroid is pretty doggone good job um, if we've got any field. Again, it's not going to last very long if you spray that lambda at R3 uh, and you get mean leaf beetles late in the season. If you're like, why do I have mean leaf beetles? Did my insecticide not work? Well, sure, it did. There was more mean beetles in the field at R3. They were there a month and a half later, and that insecticide blew this flying on. Um, one thing to note here that's three days after treatment, if you can't see that up in the corner. Um, seven days after treatment, our population increased. We're still holding them out um, in this field. Uh, by 15 days after treatment, whether the insecticide was still there or not, they were done moving into the field. Uh, when we talk about the period of time that we're trying to protect these pods, it's a relatively short period of time. So the residual in this case isn't a huge deal. <laughs> And in fact, we're going to run into the EHI uh, pretty quickly here. These were from 2021. Uh, one thing to note when we look at yield here, uh, we didn't have an effect in this case. Um, that was up around, let's see, we peaked out at 40 mean leaf beetles per 20 sweeps. Uh, meaning every time we took that sweep net through the field, we caught two mean leaf beetles. Pretty, pretty high populations in that field. We didn't end up with an impact on yield in this case. Now, small plot research, take that for what it is. It does take pretty high numbers of bees to, to move the needle when you talk about bushes. It takes a lot of that pot sorry to do that. We'll look back a year, 2020, a um, little smaller population. We have a few different materials in there. Again, they all did. A pretty good job of killing mean leaf beetles. They're not that hard to kill uh, with most of what we're using. Um, in this case, again, the population jumped up a little bit, uh, still holding them out there at 14 days after. Um, here this year, we looked at that pod star. And we had, it was a little bit smaller. Well, it was a single population. In this case, we're 20 in 10 sweeps, so still around two per sweep in 2020. The, the level of pod feeding that we saw through most of that field, around 5%, 3%, maybe a little over 5% in one treatment. One thing you note there, we didn't have a lot of differences between these different treatments in pod scar in this case. When we busted those seeds, those <coughs> pods open to look at the seed, um, we found like three damage seeds. So, like, like in all of those plots, very, very low numbers of damage seed. Again, the actual amount of quality damage that you get is going to depend a little bit on how much moisture there is out of the field. Uh, it's going to depend on when that scarring occurred, how early in the potting process you got it. Um, so, don't think that just because you have these damaged pods that that's translating directly to yield and quality loss. There's some other factors involved there. In this case, the actual damage that we saw was pretty meager. Um, and the impact on quality at the end of the day uh, really didn't occur, even with a fairly high population. When we talk about a threshold here, again, this is a bit of a nominal threshold, but our rule of thumb is going to be somewhere between 5 to 10 percent of pods where that damage. Um, and you're leaving closer to 10% when you're later in that pod development. If it's occurring earlier, um, if it's occurring in late R5 or early R6, maybe back that off a little bit, closer to 5% um, pod feeding. Those are the kind of levels that we're looking at. When that's happening, when you're at that level of pod scarring out of the field, your level of being leaf beetle is going to be high. Okay, it, it's not something you're liable to miss 
much easier to scout for than state funds, that's for sure. The numbers that it's going to take to cause economic damage in your field are going to be far, far for this insect. You can tolerate a lot more of this kind of damage, again, because not all of it's translated directly to seed damage. Any questions about being the field? Um, pod scar, pod damage. I'd say in Champaign County over the last few years, this has probably been the most impactful insect we've had um, up here. Yes, sir. A lot of chatter in the industry about the MX. Removed from the movie. Yep. Um, did that influence numbers? So it's, it's a little hard to say. One of the things we see here, um, certainly those neonics are having an effect on. One thing that happens in these sweeping fields, they kind of gain up on the first few fields that come up, um, and then they sort of water down. From there. So, how much of a population level effect we're having on them um, from these seed treatments? I'm not really sure. The other thing to talk about in the fields, they've got a lot of other folks. So, it's not just soybean that they're coming out of um, the way, you know, maybe some of them expect this. So, as far as what the overall implications of that would be, I'm not really sure. Um, but they certainly do have an effect. They probably have a bit of a repelling effect in addition to straight toxicity. Anyone else? Well, it looks like I used up almost all my time on pod feeders, which is good because that's what I intend to do. What's up? Yeah, I have a very small question. So, if you have the, the bee, beetle, and the, the stink bugs in the same area, will the, will the stink bugs use those openings you have an easy access to see? I can see them in that. Yeah, that's a great question. I've never seen it happen before. Um, what we find in a lot of cases, fields that, and in fact, the geography where we see a lot of this, and the geography where we're seeing more stink bugs down in the south don't necessarily overlap a lot. Stink bugs don't need that. Um, it would be an interesting observation to see what happens when you have both of them. But I don't I, I know yeah, for sure. And you can make, make that happen in the lab. Oh, yeah, we, we can make it happen in the lab. Uh, it'd be kind of cool to see. Any other questions? Thing. I'm just because we're getting towards the end here. Um, I'm going to highlight a couple of things. One, these are PHIs on those insecticides that I ran, at least the commercial insecticides I ran in the test. Um, yeah, you're talking anywhere between 18 and 30 days. So obviously, when we're talking about getting into, you know, R6, R6 and a half, maybe R7, uh, when you need to make one of these, you, you got to be thinking about this. Um, you got to be thinking about what's legal to apply, but is other thing I wanted to mention here. The only thing I'm going to say uh, about these defoliation thresholds, because I belabored this quite a bit last year, it was all I talked about last year. We updated our economic thresholds for defoliated insects based on modern commodity prices, based on some newer yield loss relationships. They're lower than they used to be, uh, kept it the same in the vegetative stages. Uh, 10% R3 to R5, that's when that plant's going to be the most vulnerable to yield loss from the foliation <coughs> up to 15 percent of our place. one thing to note here these are quite a bit lower you know we used to be 30 20 it is what we talked about we did a survey throughout the north central region we're still not exceeding these levels very often um actually to the tune we, we exceeded it one out of 65 times when we went out and sampled the fields where someone thought we had some foliation uh, so keep that in mind. It takes a lot of strict foliation um, to move the needle here. Da, 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 da. Yeah, here's some pictures of what that actually looks like. And, and that's the other thing to keep in mind. 10% uh, foliation, it's a lot of foliation. 15%, it's a lot. You're unlikely to let levels like that go by without noticing them. And one of the ways to think about this, if you're walking out into the field and it's not sort of blowing you away on the insect foliation you have out there, you're probably not at economic levels for the foliator in general. 
That's not taken into account the pod modifiers. That's not taken into account pod feed. That's not taken into account these other kinds of damage. These sorts of relationships are part of the reason why, as an entomologist in general, I'd like you to think a little more about these pod feeders, uh, which are having an effect on yield. A little less about like your Japanese beetles and green clover worms that can have an effect on yield, but usually do. Um, cover crops, we did a bunch of stuff in cover crops with soybeans. Uh, we don't find an impact on insects and soybeans very often. When we do, it's armyworms, it's slugs because of the residue, it's voles, which I don't really know what to do about. We talked about herb voles. Talked about that five or six times today. Uh, just spray with lead that actually does kill them. Um, I don't know what the economic threshold is on that. Other thing I wanted to point out to you here uh, so, all of the insecticide data that I showed you today, you can find those at that website at the top. That's a go.illinois.edu slash pest management research report, or you can do 2022 pest pathogen ARB. Or you can do 2021 pest pathogen ARB. They're all the same. Um, so you can find the last five years of data um, up at that point. Yes, sir. Any concern with late season movement of corn rootworm beetles into soybeans other than egg laying? No, just egg laying. Um, one thing we've noted over the last few years our populations of corn rootworm and soybean typically pretty low um, compared to historical levels, very low. Get north by 80. You're seeing probably more northern corn, western corn, and soybean like that, which is really kind of fascinating. Um, we don't think they're laying eggs out there. They have in the past. One species could do it, so why not another? Right? We haven't documented them laying eggs in soybean. Of course, they have the extended diapause trait where you need to be watching those fields for a few years. Anyway, um, but yeah, good question. We don't see levels of defoliation with those rootworm species that really concern us, and we don't see any pod scar in those species. Uh, yeah, well, unfortunately, we got to wrap up. So. Yeah, the book is all gone. Appreciate y'all's time. Yeah, let's nice see. Thank you, Nicole. Well, Jake, and I think we'll be sticking around if you have questions, but thank you all so much for joining this breakout session.